Um, I want to welcome you to this webinar on anti-racism and ed educational leadership. This is, uh, as, as some of you know, this is one of a series of webinars focusing on different aspects of racism and anti-racism in education. And I want to start by recognizing Dr. Antoinette Linton, who's the person who's led this series of webinars. So I want to thank Dr. Linton for providing this opportunity. Uh, my name is Eugene Fujimoto. I'm in the Department of Educational Leadership at Cal State Fullerton. And I've had the pleasure of working with this uh, brilliant team of scholars who will be presenting today. I want to briefly ask uh, each of the presenters to say your name, your current position, and the institution at which you do your work. So could you start, Dr. Jones? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Valida Jones, and I am the inaugural director for the Office of Success Coaching. I'm at Cal State San Marcos. Thank you. Dr. Choi? Hi, everyone. Uh, Daniel Choi, uh, Associate Press Professor in Educational Leadership on the P-12 side. Great. Just a second. Uh, Dr. Black? Hello, I'm Ernest Black. I'm the system-wide director for Cal State Teach. I work at the CSU Chancellor's Office. Okay. Dr. Person. Good afternoon. My name is Don Person. I'm a professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at California State University Fullerton. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Educational Access and Leadership. Thank you. Dr. Watkins. Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Watkins, and I am an assistant professor at Cal State Fullerton. Great. So I'm just going to say a few introductory words and then we'll get started. Um, I think most people would agree that we're in a leadership crisis in the U.S. and some would say in our educational institutions as well. At the same time, uh, as my colleague Dr. Dean Joe Curry reminds me, with every crisis comes opportunity. And with educational and social inequities laid bare by COVID-19 and police violence, we are interested in understanding the historical nature of the crisis and its current manifestations towards transforming what we do in education toward a more just, equitable, and inclusive education. Our hope today in this brief window of time is to stimulate, stimulate your thinking and subsequent action on the role you can play in this transformation. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Um, and to get us started, I want to talk, uh, turn it over to Dr. Don Person, who's going to lead us in a brief activity to get us thinking about this. Okay. Dr. P? Yeah, so what I'd like to ask each of you to do is to think about this notion of justice, uh, the notion of being equitable and inclusive. I want you to just um, allow yourselves to come into this moment, uh, to let go of whatever uh, experiences you encountered earlier in this day and what may be ahead for you this evening and to give yourself this gift of time for the next hour or so to focus on our conversation today about uh, anti-racist leadership. Regardless of what position you may be in at your school or at your institution, uh, our philosophy is that everyone is a leader or everyone has the potential to be a leader and that leadership happens and can happen from where you sit, where you stand, from whatever space you occupy within the school or the college or the university where you work. And what we want you to do right now is to just, if, if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes or just relax for a minute and think about the space that you work in. In what ways is your educational environment as it is right now just? In what ways do you see it as being equitable and inclusive? When we think about justice as being that caring about everyone, about all that we serve, equitable, providing what people need, and inclusive, listening, understanding, and hearing all voices and valuing them equally. In what ways does your environment, your work environment, look and feel like that? Just can give you a moment to that question or a series of questions. As you're reflecting, if there are words or feelings or ideas or thoughts that come to mind, jot them down. Uh, 
because we'll ask you to be reflecting on that as we go through this seminar. You want them to put it in the chat, Dr. P? The other thing I'd like for you to do now is to think about that same space, that same work environment, those same conditions, and the feelings that were evoked when I asked the question of you, uh, in what ways is your environment just, equitable, and inclusive? Now I want you to think about that same environment. In what ways is it anti-racist? In what ways are you in that space anti-racist in the ways that you currently understand that term? In what ways are you action oriented and eliminating racist actions and behaviors in your environment? How does the environment support you and support an anti-racist orientation to your work as educational leaders? Again, just reflect on those questions for a minute. Jot down any, you can use the chat room as Dr. Fujimoto suggested to write any comments or any feelings that are evoked as I raise these questions for you. As we work through our time together today, we'd like to ask you to stay connected with the feelings and the ideas that were provoked when those questions were asked of you. In what ways does your space support you, support just, equitable, and inclusiveness, support uh, educational environments for you to do your work, and in what ways are you yourself acting in that manner? And we're going to move through this experience with you today, but we want you to be with us in the experience so that we're not talking at you, but that we're talking with each other and learning together in this process. You have some outstanding facilitators today who are going to walk us through um, a series of ideas, theories, and concepts. And what we want to make sure that you are doing as you do this work is Reflect, being reflective as you hear us and as we think and share and work together. Um, some of you have talked about issues of decolonization of the curriculum. Some of you have mentioned professional development. Some of you have mentioned working with um, each other, with your peers, your colleagues. Some of you have talked about the leadership teams. So we're gonna be thinking about and, and playing with these notions and ideas as we move through our presentation today. So I will pass it back to our next colleague. Okay. Hi again, everyone. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I put in the chat a, a link to a resource list that's gonna appear uh, later on in the presentation as well, but I, I linked to it because there's a couple definitions in that link that I'll be referring to when I uh, get to it. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Don, for that. That was um, really helpful in helping to set the stage for the presentation. Uh, before I go further in the presentation, as part of the overview, I want to further frame our uh, discussion of anti-racism and leadership in perhaps <clears throat> uh, more relatable terms. Uh, and that's in thinking about or characterizing educational leaders as brokers, brokers of a just, equitable, and inclusive education. And then to that end, uh, why we need to be anti-racist uh, to do this role uh, justice. Okay, so I know many of us in the field like to talk about our students having agency. And without getting too technical, that usually means uh, our students having voice and often choice in, in how they learn. The hard truth we have to reckon with, however, uh, is that for many of our students of color, especially our black students that we serve, it's not been the reality. And as educational leaders, um, we've played no small part in allowing this uh, to go on. 
So think about the context, the frame again for a moment. And for as much as we want students to have agency, the reality is that they are for the most part minors um, and talk about mostly about P12. Also consider though, that for the younger students, they have not, you know, as, as Ken Howe puts it, fully developed the capacity to deliberate. And so they can't fully exercise their rights and maximize their opportunities in the same way as if you know, they were adults. So consequently, the students have no choice but to rely on adults, um, really educational leaders, whether inside or outside the classroom, um, to act on their behalf and to ensure that they one day or, or in the current day possess the ability to exercise freedom and opportunity. In other words, the reality is their rights and their opportunities are mediated by the adults, by educational leaders. So practically, students' rights and opportunities are only as real and as meaningful and equal as the adults care to present them to our students, particularly our students of color and other students experiencing social disadvantages. So if we're being honest, uh, we as educational leaders have not done a good enough job, especially in treating racism as a threat, you know, a threat to the students we serve, to their agency, and more deeply, their sense of self-respect, and therefore their overall quality of education. We can do better. And doing better means we need to take racism in its many forms, both in its overt and hidden forms, much more seriously. It also requires more from us. It requires us to be vigilant, really to be anti-racist, because otherwise we passively watch it live on, undisturbed in the culture of our organizations, through structures, policies, and, and processes. So it means adopting an anti-racist education approach. So what does that mean? Enid Lee talks about it this way, and again, I, I linked it, linked to it in the chat. Enid Lee talks about it this way. She talks about it as a proactive strategy for dismantling racist structures and yet also for building, for building up racial justice and equality. Can we read that part again? Proactive strategy for dismantling racist structures and yet also building racial justice and equality. It must become a perspective that cuts across all sorts of areas and institutional practices. So I'm gonna pause there and, and, and that said, you know, there, are, there are a lot of other really important terms and concepts that will be useful for us to know for the rest of the presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ernest to share some of those terms with you. Okay, good afternoon. I almost said good morning, but good afternoon. I'm gonna go over just a few of the terms that we're gonna use throughout this presentation. Before I do that, I want to remind everyone that nothing we say here is a new concept. No words we're gonna speak here today are words that no one's ever spoken before. So racism has been embedded in American culture, right? So we know that it exists here. We're trying to grapple with what do we do now? So that's where we come into this definition of terms. How do we define, begin to define these terms so we can eradicate as best we can racism in this country. So I'm gonna start with implicit bias. Implicit bias is the, are, are the attitudes that we hold towards people without really knowing that person. So for example, if when I walk into a school district and I see scores of black boys in the office, they're being suspended that day. I know that there are some attitudes that people hold about black boys in general because they didn't do anything differently than anyone else in that school did, but they're the ones being suspended that day, right? So, you know, these attitudes, conscious or unconscious, kind of permeate into our lives and what they form what we mostly call microaggressions. You know, uh, grabbing your purse when you see a black man walking down the street, for example, um, sending boys to the office, etc. cetera. Uh, Equity-minded, 
Now, this is a way of thinking that calls attention to patterns of inequity. Meaning, you know, we're, we're willing to take personal and institutional responsibilities for the success or failure of our students or not and critically re reassessing our own practices. So when we take a look at what we know we're doing wrong, that is, is the essence of being equity-minded. So when we take a look at the lack of diversity in our teacher ranks and our educator ranks and our faculty ranks, when we take a critical look at that, that's the beginnings of being equity-minded. Cultural competency. Now, a basic definition is an ability to interact effectively with people of other cultures. That's just basic, right? Before even getting into the nuances of it. So cultural competence kind of comprises four different components. One is awareness of your own culture. And I will share with you if your own culture has been muted for 400 years, you don't have the same cultural capacity as others, right? If you've been assimilated, assimilated into American culture and, and the lack of really loving your own culture, then you don't have that awareness of your own culture. So part of this also is that dominance of the majority culture. You know, we have to understand, as I saw in the chat, know thyself, but what you, what you bring to the table and what you don't. So I'm gonna paraphrase David Ruffin here. You know, ain't nobody talking about you, Otis. So everything isn't about you. So when you look at this worldview, but the worldview surrounds you, that's that lack of cultural competence as well. Uh, another aspect component, the attitude and acceptance of cultures different than yours. So, you know, for the past four years specifically, but my lifetime in general, you know, you hear jokes made about black people eating watermelon and chicken. Uh, Latinx people eating tacos, etc. If that's your thing, then you lack that cultural competence because what you're doing is associating uh, what you feel are negative traits to another culture. So you haven't gotten to that cultural competency piece yet. Another component, knowledge of different cultures and practices and worldview. As I said before, yours isn't the only one. How do you acknowledge that? How do you embrace other cultures and other worldviews? And finally, cross-cultural skills. Now, the four eyes of oppression, internalized, ideolo ideological, institutional, and interpersonal. So let's start with internalized. If I oppress you for so long that you now oppress yourself, that is that internalized form of oppression. We see it a lot with animals, for example. You know, I had a dog and every day we walked the same route. One day she got out, but she only went that far because to her, that's as far as she could go. The other one, interpersonal, the idea that one group is better than another and has the right to control another. And that's what we see a lot. That's what we saw a lot in the early 1900s with white Christians is that they use what they call their God to basically oppress someone else as it was their God given right to do so. Ideological is categorizing based on race and gender um, and institutional, what most of us experience is how this plays out in the world. So how does this play out in schools? So yes, schools have AP classes, but who gets to take them? Uh, schools have access to college counselors, but who gets to see them? 
And all of this plays out in a very long run in how this world works. We can talk about redlining, for example. You know, we could talk about the lack of credential teachers in certain schools, okay? Intersectionality, how race, class, and gender and other individual characteristics intersect and overlap with each other. For example, uh, my son is an engineer. I love saying that because, you know, he's an engineer and I feel like I did something there. Um, he went to an all engineering college. It was 75% male. 75% male. And there were even less people of color. So there were a few black females at this school. So not only did they have to deal with the oppression of being female at this engineering school, but also being black at this engineering school. Empathy, when we talk about empathy, and I don't want this to be confused with sympathy. Sympathy means, you know, I feel bad for that person. What a horrible life they're having. Um, so empathy is to really understand, recognize, understand what that person is feeling, what they're going through, and the factors that may have contributed to that. Finally, my two, I have two more, I think. Being an ally, showing support, speaking up or speaking out, and speaking out, I should say. So you're, you're standing up to the plate, you're saying this is wrong, that's an ally. A co-conspirator, on the other hand, is plotting with you. This is wrong, what are we gonna do about it? The final definition that I'm gonna cover is educational martyrism. It was developed by Dr. Patrick DeWalt at Fresno State, and the definition is simply the degrees and levels of risk and sacrifices that persons of African descent experience in the education of the United States when confronting structural and systemic racism. So for example, Kimberly Crenshaw is the developer of the term intersectionality. If you do a YouTube search, you will see about three or four videos of her. You will see hundreds of videos that say she's a quack, right? So she stood in that realm and she took the hits for it. And that's educational martyrism. Decolonization, I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Dr. Choi. Thank you, Ernest. Uh, the slides you see in front of you uh, just give you a sense of where we're coming from when we uh, mentioned the term decolonization. And we're talking about decolonization of the mind. Right? So when we talk about this, we're talking about drawing from historical periods in places where uh, we see this colonizing, this imperial domination happening. Uh, but it also, we're, we're drawing from the logic of those actions, the threat to draw those actions, uh, colonial, coloniality referring to the logic of domination. And <clears throat> it's that thinking put into action that leads to inequity and lack of knowledge um, that, it's, that itself has, has continued. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I wanna just make mention, um, I think it's the next, yeah, socialization process that's related to this. I, I want you to take a few minutes, to take a few seconds to really look at what's on this bulleted list, structure of thinking, nature of what we know, how we, how we know what we know. These are all things I, I want you to be thinking about as I try to unpack this concept a little bit more uh, for you all. Um, so I want to share why I think decolonization is a core concept of being anti-racist. Okay. So remember what I shared earlier, and, and that definition is, another definition that I'm going to be referring to is in, is in that um, link in the chat. Uh, what Nina Led says about anti-racism and dismantling racist structures, if you can think back to what I read before, uh, racist structures typically exist in environments uh, and cultures where there is a dominant culture and one in which you either belong or, or you don't. Um, when you don't belong and are on the outside looking in, let's, let's say at a school, uh, racist structures remind you all the time of all the ways uh, you don't belong, officially and, and unofficially. Uh, not only do racist structures 
formally, have the unique ability to, to formally enable unjust practices. It also in less obvious ways affirms, it also normalizes a way of thinking, uh, you know, a racist way of thinking. So, and, and so and these become so embedded in the thinking that it permeates an organization to such a degree that it appears as though it's, it's trapping people into thinking a certain way. And that, think, and that to think and behave differently than what's expected is somehow considered abnormal or deviant or defiant or even a threat or just, or just flat wrong. When this goes unchallenged, those in the organization tend to internalize this thinking, even to their own detriment, to their own oppression. And so to understand this better, you know, Enid Lee also offers a, a definition of racism that I think, given the context, we'll understand a little bit better. She defines racism as the use of institutional power to deny or grant people and groups of people rights, respect, representation, and resources based on their skin color. Racism in action makes whiteness a preferred way of being human. Racism is reflected in hierarchy in which beauty, intelligence, worth, and things associated with whiteness are at the top. The school is one site in which hierarchical arrangement of skin power is confirmed daily. Okay. Her definition is great because it captures well not just the overt displays of racism, but also the hegemony, the, the latent, the implicit colonizing of beliefs that are, that are the lifeblood, really, of racist structures. These beliefs and the actions that flow from them may not be overtly, rec outwardly recognizable, but these are the conditions from which marginalized students need to be freed or, de or decolonized, really. Such a framing is necessary to make visible the invisible and undisturbed ways that the privileging of mainstream dominant attitudes and behavior has an impact of restraining marginalized students from experiencing the same kind of freedom in learning agency um, as their non-marginalized counterparts. So when the privileging of mainstream knowledge and practices as norms are tied consciously or un unconsciously to what is right and wrong, normal, abnormal, and these, aren't, and these are not explicitly taught, uh, marginalized students are, are again practically restrained and so unable to maximize equity opportunities under these conditions. So decolonizing or what some call an emancipatory perspective enables us to recognize the oppressive quality of such practice, especially when schools, school success is tied to that kind of thinking. And there's such norms um, that stem from it as well. The tricky part of this is that these norms are unofficial and yet they carry the weight of official rules. So if we are not decolonizing or in house terms, denormalizing, then we better ask ourselves this. Are we not just telling our students then that if you don't talk a certain way or think a certain way or socialize in a certain way, then you can't be successful? And if we don't disrupt this, are we not offering something like a false choice of what, or what Moses calls an impoverished social context of choice? Because we really believe that the best choice we can offer our students you know, of color is a choice between either playing by the rules of the dominant culture um, and, and compromising their cultural identity or refusing to play then, uh, and then paying a price for preserving it. So it seems the choice is either to embrace the practice of, of active white or dominant culture to succeed in school or adopt an oppositional stance that often dooms them to uh, poor performance. This is going on and, and we need a decolonizing anti-racist orientation and approach uh, to stop it. So the decolonizing perspective then I, I hope is clearer now and, in, and hopefully it equips our minds to be, uh, be anti-racist. Too. Before we transition, this is a slide that I want to just make sure that, that we're all thinking about, uh, given what's shared so far. And we love the quote here, the education system is doing exactly what it's designed to do and doing quite well. So to keep that sort of in mind, given what was shared, um, hope what's been shared so far has, has made things a little bit clearer. Thank you. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to um, draw your attention to the concept of culture um, in a new way of looking at culture. Culture provides a general design for living and patterns for interpreting one's reality. Why is this important to look at it this way? It's because your culture teaches people the knowledge of yourself as well as knowledge of others. Culture also helps to norm reality for you and the way you think about others. And culture is this huge database, human information uh, that helps you make judgments, um, decisions and actions. In essence, culture is the way you think about, you talk about, you interact and the way you are. And ultimately what we're trying to do as we work towards becoming anti-racist educational leaders is becoming more culturally competent. So that requires us to, to take a look at how we've been shaped by our, our cultural paradigms and think about perhaps shifting. But a couple of things need to happen before that. For one, we need to learn cultural literacy. So what is cultural literacy? It's the ability to understand and participate fluently within your culture and others. It is also important for us to learn culture humility. Humility means that I respect your culture. I respect my culture. And they can both exist within the same framework. And then lastly, we need to understand cultural flexibility. That means that I have the ability to not only work within my cultural framework, but across cultural frameworks with others, with understanding. All of these things begin to bring us to this place of cultural competency, where we have the ability to understand, to communicate with, to effectively interact with, with people from all cause cultures and be respectful of that. It is important for us to understand our own worldview as Dr. Choi and Dr. Black have already alluded to. And because it helps us to develop a positive attitude towards other culture, cultural ways of being. It also helps us gain knowledge about these different practices in reference to ours and see where there are similarities and where I call unified opportunities for differences. And then we can also develop skill sets and communications to interact across cultures. This all brings us to a place of cultural pluralism, which is the great utopia. It's my unicorn place, I like to say, where we can equally coexist and be of diverse backgrounds. Um, it's important for us as educational leaders to begin to understand that strengthening our equity, diversity, and inclusive skills as a scholar, a thought leader, and mentors will build a strong foundation for us to grow professionally. Next slide, please. Now, most of us have been trained to be leaders in this way, either authoritarian, more control, we manage people, it's more of a linear process, hierarchical, not visionary. It's more routine. I just have to complete these things to make it happen. Um, there's not really a lot of strategy, just some strategy. And it's not really um, developmental. I'd like to invite you to think about things differently. Living in, we all live in a, a highly complex and connected world and environment. And that requires us to shift our current habitual mindset and change to more of a growth mindset. Because after all, we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of consciousness in which we created them. We have a great opportunity currently today to begin to think differently about how we lead people how we work with people, how we share our leadership. Let's explore what it means to shift our leadership paradigm 
by examining how we would rethink, reframe, reconstruct a more conscious leadership, one that is more equitable, more purposeful, more intentional, more accountable and responsible. Because after all, we can no longer just manage inequities and equalities. We have to interrupt them and transform them. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to begin to rethink our leadership practices. Unfortunately, consciousness is not an autogenetic process. It's something that has to be cultivated in both ourselves and others who we would like to be leaders alongside of us. It becomes very important for us who wish to become anti-racist educational leaders to begin thinking about what it means to be an inclusive, fair and equitable leader. We have to learn to lean into our discomfort and expect that it's gonna be messy at times. And that's okay because we're gonna learn balance and order, harmony, reciprocity, justice, righteousness. All of those will be the principles that guide us. Your role as a leader in that capacity would be to bring the chaos to order by examining the patterns and the themes that are in the environment. Um, look at what's emerging and focus on the potentiality of solutions versus just, you know, becoming fearful and thinking of the same old ways of problem solving. We have a great opportunity to think outside the box, to remain in the place of and instead of being binary, either or. We also need to adopt a growth mindset that is more open to change and transform transformation. And again, shift from that habitual fixed mindset because that mindset is not going to solve the problems that we have today. Understand that a leader's philosophical orientation is critical to understanding the willingness to rethink how leadership is practiced. Next slide, please. Now, this, this can be very challenging at times because it, it, it requires us to take a closer look at ourselves. We have to also do the work we have to become self-reflective because consciousness is the real power that we hold as anti-racist leaders. That understanding of self, becoming aware of our own implicit bias, whatever racism that may be lengthened, the inequalities that we may have experienced and how that may feel for others. Exclusionary practices are in place looking at those. We have to become self-aware and care for ourselves and others and understand what hot buttons push us to freeze up and to not act. Because at this particular time, we have to act. We're in that moment, uh, we're done talking. We have to now move to action. We also have to, again, recognize our biases because yes, we all have them. Whether we want to recognize them or not, we have to think about how we lead how we share our leadership practice, how we move towards change and transformation. Is it fair? Is it equitable? Is it inclusive? Or is it more like what I talked about in the beginning, more authoritarian, more controlling? Well, I'd like to offer you an opportunity to become a conscious leader. And what that is, is someone who's grounded in a social cultural knowledge of reciprocity and it allows for leaders to perceive the patterns and the environment, see interconnectivity across areas, departments, institutions, communities, and also be able to look at the interconnectivity of multiple problems and solve them as a group, as a community of practice and be responsible. Again, being purposeful, intentional, accountable and responsible. This requires you to really understand what's going on inside of you and what's going on outside of you because the human mind is a master at building barriers. We can be better at 
take deconstructing those barriers. We can learn to maintain our consciousness. Cognitively, we can manage our thoughts better. Focus on the positivity, the potentiality. Again, focusing on the internal, what's going on inside of me, being authentic and truthful about what that is and doing the work to make yourself aware. Looking at the interpersonal, the relationship between you and others, how you engage. You may not think that you are engaging in a racist perspective or a biased um, perspective, but you may. You have to take a look at all of that. Next slide, please. And then finally, we get to this place of reconstructing what our leadership should look like. And it's gonna take us through some, some zones, if you will. Initially, we're gonna be paralyzed with fear because we're gonna be thinking about, you know, all of the things that we, we, we discover about ourselves, right? It's gonna be uncomfortable. Then we'll move into a learning, a learning zone where we're taking in all this information. And then finally, we're going to get this place of growth. But before you can do all of that, you have to become action oriented. And that means you have to break the science. Within our institutions, our communities, our schools, we have to begin to investigate, to analyze and address our policies, our procedures and our practices Look at what we've been doing because that's not working. It's time now to do something different. We may have to tear it down and build it back up and that's okay. That is the strength of an anti-racist leader. Create a diverse shared leadership team. This is very important because you wanna bring in people from different lenses. We heard earlier from Dr. Black, but just the, um, the understanding about what it means to be intersectional. Well, you want all of those lenses in place as you build a new way of being and existing within this educational framework. You have to become an equity-minded equity practitioner. You have to live that. You have to understand what it really truly means to be fair, to, to, to take away and remove all barriers and obstacles, to have those crucial conversations when you know something is right and everyone else is against you, but it's right for the students, it's right for the leaders, and it's right for the leaders that we're, we're training as well as educational leaders. We have to take a personal in, uh, investment in being fair and equitable because we want everyone to rise to their highest level of excellence. Now, um, something else that you would need to focus in on is organize a group of thought partners. So what is this? These are folks who are high emotional, highly emotional intelligent people. They are, have excellent equity, diversity, and inclusive skills, and they believe in practical action. Excellence is expected. Because our students that you would be provided with a problem. That, that's what happens. As thought leaders, you would assess the challenge. There's going to be moments of uncertainty, but because you've already started moving through your fears, uh, become, you know, the fear zones when you're developing as an, an anti-racist leader, you will rise to the challenge and you will come up with a collective knowledge and solutions. We don't have to do this on our own. We work better as cooperative and collective people. That's who we come from, that's who we are. And then you will apply that solution to the problem and evaluate it to make sure that it is equitable, that it is inclusive. Remember, the function of freedom is to free someone else. That is who we are when we become anti-racist educational leaders. Now I'll hand it over to my colleague. Thank you, Dr. Thank Jones. You, Dr. I'm getting some feedback. 
Uh, as Dr. Uh, Jones discussed, um, developing an anti-racist leadership framework requires educational leaders to become more aware and actually start to think about what's possible in your educational arena. Our thoughts have a lot of power. So as an educational leader, you have to be conscious of the fact that you're in a position of power. You can change and transform how educators are trained, how they're supported, how they're allowed to practice. So as a leader, embrace the fact that you create an environment that can be just, equitable, inclusive, and promotes excellence. That can be in relationship to curriculum development, uh, exploring pedagogical practices at your site. Um, your commitment to hiring and training educators of color is part of an equity agenda. As a leader, you get to develop and support those anti-racist policies, practices, and procedures that can support educators and empower them to change their cultural competency, to change their cultural philosophy. So on this slide, you, you can see that there are several opportunities uh, as part of the anti-racist leadership framework to think about how this anti-racist framework might look in practice. So, many things on there, but communication, uh, understanding your own privilege and power, looking at opportunities for professional development. Anti-racist leaders understand, or they work to understand, they're aware of the systems that they operate in. And then anti-racist leaders work to transform those systems of oppression into systems of opportunities. So you have to know how to situate people according to the assets so that the system is not only productive, but can also bring about what we've all been talking about, that belonging, that harmony, that creativity, and that growth. So thinking about how you can develop an anti-racist framework, looking at the items on, on this slide. But I like how Dr. Jones discussed thought partner opportunities. Uh, not always do we get the opportunity to practice being thought partners, but uh, Dr. Fujimoto, if you can go to the next slide. As uh, we're gonna challenge you to rethink and reframe and reinvent, uh, let's put some of our theories into practice. So we're gonna actually create the interactive portion of this webinar and have you work through a very brief case study in small groups. So the critical question for our work is, how does an aspiring social justice school leader support Black student leaders for racial equity among a resistant white staff? I'll give you the scenario on the next slide. So this is, again, a, a breakdown of a, of a larger case, which is in our resources, if you want to look at the case or use it in your work. But the scenario for you to consider is that the leaders of a black student union, the BSU, at a secondary school share their school climate and culture survey with their principal. Black youth leaders reveal a hostile and unwelcoming climate in the form of anti-blackness for black students at a school staffed primarily by white teachers. BSU students request to share their findings with the entire school staff. How does a principal who has the aspirations of being a social justice leader and the desire to incorporate the voices of marginalized groups at the school navigate a challenging context where white teaching staff exhibit resistance to creating social change at the school? We'd like you to discuss this scenario in breakout rooms. You're going to have about 10 minutes and I'm going to post both the questions and also a Padlet link for you to answer the questions either as a group or as an individual. So you can access the Padlet once you are in your breakout room. And again, you can summarize the group discussion or you can individually post your thoughts. Uh, I would like, um, you to kind of consider, as Dr. Jones said, that opportunity to be a thought partner. Uh, going to, I'm creating the breakout rooms, one moment. And you'll see these discussion prompts there as well. We'll be in these rooms for about 10 minutes.
as people are, are coming back, I just want to thank you for embracing that activity. I know that um, having conversations late in the day, especially on big meaty topics can sometimes be challenging. I enjoyed popping in on the conversations and recognize that sometimes we have all this information that we start to process and that it may sometimes even move out of the context of the case. And that's great, the conversations that I had. But I would like to invite you if you have any thoughts on the discussion questions that you have access to the Padlet, the link is in the chat and feel free to add your own individual thoughts. Uh, just as a, a quick kind of cap on this activity, if you're interested or willing to use the chat, I put a couple of debrief questions in there um, to highlight what were some of the key points from your discussion or any uh, successful strategies that you might have heard about engaging your staff or getting staff perspectives, and finally suggestions for professional development. I, I just want to close with a couple of quick comments on this part of moving the theory into practice. Understand that any of the work that we do on critical race is not just about knowing the terms or reciting the phrases or reading the books. It goes beyond that terminology. It's really about applying that lens to your everyday interactions and your experiences because racism is occurring. So as you think about the anti racist educational leadership framework. Think about and be conscious of the power that you have in your role as an educational leader and what you can do to transform the system that you are in. Thank you. So I, I want to get started on this of closing this out today and just kind of beginning to review um, what we've talked about today and, and simply say, you know, it takes a lot of work to be anti-racist. It takes a lot of work because it's the total opposite of what we've been doing this whole time. So it, it's necessary to learn from the world around you. It is necessary to broaden your scope of knowledge. It, it's necessary to understand that there is oppression. So very often we hear, well, this is not, you know, the 1800s, it's not the 1960s things. We've had a black president, things are great but you, to understand that there are systems in place that still are meant to oppress certain groups of people. A job of an anti-racist educator, uh, especially a leader, is to dismantle those systems. So we, we work in this silo in education, schools in particular, where we have a culture that we've developed. And we've developed this over time. The culture of schools have not changed. In order to be an anti-racist educator, we need to change that unchanged culture. We need to include inclusion. We need to respect diversity. We need to insist on equity and we need to do it for generations to come. Uh, Dr. Person, anything to add there? I think it's just very important that you um, value, if you, if you don't already, that you really value uh, the idea of you as a transformer, that your role will be to transform. Um, and not to rely on or count on or expect someone else to do that for you. Whether it's in your classroom, in your office, in your unit, that you are indeed the transformer. You're the conduit for that, for that change. And I think that it's also important that we recognize uh, the value in us having uh, a broad, uh, diverse community that we connect with and interact with. We talked about the thought partners, how important that is, because that's what pushes us and challenges us to move beyond where we are. 
And this is a this is work for all of us because we all have been born and raised, well, if not born in, we've certainly grown up in an anti um, in a systemically racist society. And these institutions and structures that we enter are systemically racist. So we have to all do this work, regardless of our own cultural background, gender, race, et cetera. It's, this is work that we all have to do. So having those diverse partners around you helps to challenge you and push you. And I want to encourage you all to remember that the intersectionality piece is important in all of this work. It's very important because we sometimes think about this in a kind of a monolithic kind of way and very few of us are monolithic. <laughs> very few of the issues that we deal with in our schools are monolithic. So the, the notion of intersectionality and equity mindedness to me are, uh, they, they fit in the equation of moving forward and being successful and that's important for us to do that. And I think in order to effectively do that work, we need to begin to uncover, develop, investigate, create, um, expand on our cultural uh, similarities, our cultural differences. Uh, we have to kind of look at policies, uh, systems, organizations, practices, that work to, I don't want to say dismantle culturalism, but don't work in hand in hand. It's not in accord with developing a very cultural environment at, at school sites or in our day-to-day -day lives for that matter. So we have to really look at those institutional things that have created the systems that we now have in place. So a cultural investigator will begin to look at what roles we've played in creating and maintaining systemic racism and how do we undo that role? How do we undo that? I, I'd like to, you know, also, add that when we talk about dismantling systemic racism, when we talk about celebrating culture, um, there's another side of the table that feels that they will be invisible, that they will be diminished if we go down this road. And the what about me, the Otis, if you will. So what about me, what, what's gonna happen to me uh, a, the cultural investigator, you know, maintains that there's a seat for everyone at the table, but so far the table hasn't had anyone but those people. And you can't have a really diverse, meaningful society run by one group of people. We've, we've seen that. We see it. It doesn't work. So it is our job to support, create support, develop anti-racist racist curriculum and stand in that path, be that educational martyr. When those arrows come and they will, we have to be able to explain specifically why this is a benefit to the school, why this is a benefit to the district, why it's a benefit to the state, why it's a benefit to the country. So it has to translate into being equity and equitable and equal for all. Okay. Dr. Person. And finally, uh, in closing, uh, we'd like for you to remember or maybe affirm in this moment that all of us on this uh, webinar will commit to learning and walking into and growing into this notion of being an anti-racist. And if we make that commitment today, if we haven't made it before today, if we make that today, um, recognize that, that we will in our journey make some mistakes. As Dr. Black just said, we'll have some arrows coming at us and we'll learn to dodge them. 
We might get hit a few times, but we'll get back up. And in this work, it, it requires that you're persistent. You can't stop. You have to just keep pushing yourself. You have to be resilient. Um, there's, there has to be a commitment to self-awareness so that you know where your biases are. You know what your, where the shadows are for you. You know where your racism sits. You know where your, your prejudice and discriminatory actions, uh, where they are, where your blind spots are so that you can stop them. That when you're fearful, when you're uh, upset, when you're bothered, when you feel uncomfortable, that you don't allow yourself to retreat back into comfort when you know that's not the right space for you to be in. The anti-racist educational leader is going to be consistent because that's required and expected. That you're gonna be critical of yourself. Self-criticism is an important piece of being anti-racist. You've got to do the, the work that Freire calls us to do, where you, you act, reflect, evaluate, redesign, and get back out there again. So that important piece of self-criticism, and I would say uh, self-reflection, that they go hand in hand. Uh, and doing that on a regular basis, you know, we get so busy with the day-to-day -day task of our lives, the to-do lists, that the, the self-reflection piece often gets left out. So making that a part of your daily practice, a part of your daily ritual is critical to being an effective anti-racist. Um, I would just leave you with the challenge to uh, embrace this idea of being an anti-racist, to embrace the idea of being equity-minded, and to embrace the idea that the changes in education that need to occur will come from us as educational leaders, whether it's in the classroom or outside of the classroom. And that our voices need to be heard and understood not only in our workspace and, and environment, but also in the bigger picture. Uh, as Dr. Black said earlier, what we do in our classrooms and in our schools and in our colleges and universities impact our communities, our state, and eventually the nation. So the call is there, the plea I should say is there, that we need to all become more anti-racist in our work. I will turn it back over now to uh, Dr. Fujimoto and he will lead us through the last part of our presentation. Great, thank you very much everybody. Thanks to the presenters for <laughs> leading us through that. Uh, we left some time here at the end for to hear your questions. I'm going to take down this uh, and please do it through either through the chat or if you can unmute yourself and ask any questions that you have or comments that you have. I'm going to take I have down. a comment. Okay, please. Uh, this is this is Dr. Linton. Yes. I'd like to thank the leadership uh, team for this awesome webinar. Um, this was a brainchild out of a few of us at, in the College of Education. And uh, when they asked me, who did I want to be a part of this webinar series? They, they thought it was only gonna be one webinar. And I said, you're nuts, this is racism, right? <laughs> so they said, who do you wanna be you know, on the team? Who do you, who's your dream team to work with? I named these folks that you're seeing here, and, and this is why I named them, because <laughs> this was uh, definitely a wonderful series. And I wanted to say, like, congratulations to everybody, especially the folks of you who have come to multiple ones. This is our first round. We're wrapping up our first round of webinars, and so uh, this is a, a very strong uh, ending to the first round. We plan on doing two more rounds of this. So your feedback and your questions are super important because we want to work with our community members and our colleagues uh, to move forward with this kind of work. But I just wanted to take time out to say thank you all for making this a wonderful experience for me, at least. And uh, Congratulations. Thanks, Dr. Linton. Thanks for giving us the opportunity and leading this effort. We appreciate it so much. Um, so there, there is a, a webinar survey that's uh, at the end of the PDF that was, I think, uploaded earlier. It's also in the chat. 
Um, there's also a list of resources, uh, some four resources that are uh, um, on the webinar or on the, uh, um, the PDF that you have and also a Google Doc with other, other sources. But, but we do have time for, for some questions and comments and discussions. So anybody have any comments that they'd like to share or questions? Please, Vicki. Hi, thank you guys. Uh, I, I, I always enjoy learning so much uh, and just gaining deeper perspectives. At my school, we're currently uh, engaging in, in, we're setting the platform to engage in uh, courageous and crucial conversations about race. Um, and eventually what we plan to do is to begin to have these conversations with our community as well. And we are in a we are in South Central LA, but our school is 98% Latino and Latina Latinx, um, and there is a strong sentiment of anti-blackness within the Latino Latina culture. I was wondering if you could give me some uh, some ideas that maybe I can uh, relay to our leadership team um, in regards how can we establish that platform and those parameters, not just in our school, but within our community and dealing with families and parents um, and engaging in these crucial conversations that are necessary to create change. Nice to have these easy questions up front, folks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so presenters, any thoughts about this, about the, uh, the, the uh, the prejudice that exists within our communities of color that, that can know, get that way. And, and we as Black Americans deal with this from a lot of different um, people, you know, different cultures in our country. I, I would suggest that the community find the similarities. Find an elder because mm -hmm. that community was once all Black. Mm -hmm. Ask mm -hmm. them what happened <laughs> when they moved there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. did they try to run them out? Were they accepting? Because I'm gonna, I'll tell you something. The most loving place to live in, in America is the Black community, because we will take you in, no matter who you are. You, we're gonna talk about you, because you look different. You, you're different than what we know. But we're going to take you in and we're going to make you one of ours. So I would say, you know, number one, look for those similarities between the cultures because it's the neighborhood and there's the neighborhood is the neighborhood, period. Also, look for some of the Latinx elders who can talk about what it was like when they moved there and, and get their voice involved in this. I think it's also important for people to understand between the, you know, people of African descent and Latinx people that you have a, a um, parallel existence, you know, to show the similarity. Those pyramids that are in Peru and Mexico, they got the idea from Africa, you know, from ancient Kemet. And so a lot of times people don't understand the, who has been influencing who. You know, African people are first world people. We're not just first nation people. We gave birth to everybody. You know, that's not to negate anybody's special uniqueness, but let's tell the truth from the beginning. And I think that's why you see all the hostility because people don't understand that. And like people don't understand their, you know, during the times of Che, they took a, a, a colony of people to Africa who some of them still live there that are Latinos that live in Africa, right? So we got, we got to start looking at the, the, the similarities that we have in existence versus the differences. Um, when I first moved here from Michigan, I became real close to Latino people because their lifestyles and their ways of being were similar to how I was raised, the community. You know, so because African people have culture and community and we don't always see that on TV because they always showing the the, the oppressive, the, the downtrodden. Um, and then we have to make people remember that um, 
you know, how, how they came into an existence from the indigenous culture of who they are, the native people, right? And, and, and denial of that as well. So those are just some things, but I agree with Dr. Black, find the elders so that they can have conversation about all of these things. And then look at how we're more similar than we are different. Uh, I have Afro Latino friends that are Guatemalan, they're Brazilian, um, Puerto Rican, Dominican, all of that. And Dr. Linton knows them because they're my, she, they're our friends. They're my friends too. <laughs> and we talk about blackness and we talk about what we it do. means to be uh, speakers of two oppressor languages. Exactly. English and Spanish are both colonial yes, languages, yes. right? <laughs> they were doing the same things to us. And so mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Black said something about understanding that that's internalized racism. And this, mm -hmm. this tendency for oppressed people want to have a proximity to whiteness and assimilate and want to move away from blackness because we're the lower caste in this country. And so all these kinds of behaviors exasperates the fact that we're actually not holding our political candidates to the fire, not articulating the needs for everyone so that everybody can thrive. And the fact that China has more ninth graders than we do people and we're competing against global power. So this conversation about who's better than mm -hmm. what is counterproductive to this mm -hmm. country staying a global economic power. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we situate it in a discussion that's productive, and we stop playing like 50% uh, of white kids can't read either. We don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're trying to navigate something that really doesn't exist, this kind of proximity. If I can just not be black and get closer to white, then we can all succeed. And then look behind us and the, and the white boys are suffering too. So these conversations need to happen so that we can all lift each other up with a healthy identity, get rid of the internalized racism and for white kids and, and white folk internalized guilt and hatred because of the mythology. And we can move forward as a country, but we have to have honest conversations. And I think elders will facilitate that post -taste. I just want to add one very small, because I know our time is of, of, of essence, but one other piece to this, Vicki, is that all of what everybody just said to you, I agree with 100%. And this is a wonderful way of blocking our collective gifts. Mm -hmm. If we fight amongst ourselves, then nobody has to worry about us, right? Because we're busy mm -hmm. fighting each other. And instead of building on the assets and the gifts that exist within our communities as a collective, we end up destroying each other. And to me, this is a immediate, it's, it's the, the oppressor mindset that was mentioned earlier playing itself out. And it gives me hope to know that if we can learn that oppression so well, that we can also learn to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of changing our mindset and taking that energy. So teaching our children, you know, and that's, you know, the elders had to do that to a certain degree in order for them to survive to the degree that they have. They just did, probably didn't call it that, right? So we have a term that we can place on it. We need to teach our children this whole idea of being anti-racist and how to, to, um, to have a growth mindset because it really is about that. I'll just add one quick piece has to, uh, the kind of the overlay of white supremacy that we forget, I think, that when groups are divided, that's by design as part of what the white supremacist structure and system we've created, it does that, right? So and not to get into blaming each other, but looking at the larger system and structure, I think is pretty important. Well, it looks like we're, we're actually out of time, but I, I think some of us are willing to stick around if you wanted to, uh, to chat. Um, I wanna really encourage you to give us uh, your feedback on the, on the um, uh, feedback sheet and, um, and then look at the resources as well. And you may have some to share with us as well. Someone asked about this, this uh, video recording um, I assume it's going to be available, Dr. Linton, is that right? I think she may have stepped yes. away. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> y'all just need to give me the, or there's a Dropbox when y'all, um, 
You may want to do a screencast of this and drop it off in a like Camtasia and record it and get a link and then we can put it in the Dropbox. Okay, well we'll make sure and get that get that done to folks who are participating here. But um, and can you please, uh, in your own way here, give give a hand to the presenters who did a wonderful job today? Thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, um, like I said, we'll, we'll stick around, some of us, for a little bit if you still want to talk some more. But I uh, wanted to thank you all for, for being part of this today. And thanks for, uh, for being here. Thanks for all the work that you do. And uh, know that you're not out there alone on this. And there's a lot of folks trying to do the work. And we're always here for you to, to engage with and talk with and get support, too. So thanks very much, everybody. Good to see you. <laughs>